Our frumpy housewife, who well, sounds like Shelley Duvall from The Shining. <laughs> Everyone's job performance is going to be linked to how well we use these machines. On this particular occasion, my husband just used too much strength and he injured Danny's arm. Both of their children were being molested. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> what, Danny? <laughs> yeah, Jack Torrance. He wasn't molested. He was abused. Jack but... Torrance was fucking Danny. No. Everybody that's knows. A, here. That's a theory. Everybody Fuck knows that. the subtext of the shining. Fuck that shit. It's, it's just the sort of thing you do a hundred times with a child, you know, in the park or in the streets. We're gonna do the scariest thing that's ever been on American television. We're really coming to get you. Miniseries form is the single best format because it allows the length to serve the story instead of the story having to serve the length. We're telling the whole story of the book. The story it tells is huge in scope. I love miniseries. The Shining is not what people perceive it to be. It's a story about a family that's trying to save itself. But the real haunting that really struck me as an actress is the haunting of rage. I mean, this guy loves his family desperately, but every obstacle that can be thrown in his way is there. Did you like Kubrick's film of The Shining? No. Cold. I'm not a cold guy. I mean, uh, just out on that one meeting that I thought that he was a very compulsive, almost like anal man. In my books, it's, there's a warmth, there's a reaching out and saying to the reader, uh, I want you to be a part of this. And with Kubrick's The Shining, I felt that it was very cold. In Kubrick's movie, The Overlook Hotel freezes, and in Stephen King's book, The Overlook Hotel burns, but that was the difference in temperament. He was cold and I was warm. I think that it's still possible to scare people in a really honorable way if they care about the characters. You can't be afraid, really, for the characters if they're just cardboard cutouts. You shut up. You can't hurt me. Without Danny and Jack to help you, you're nothing. You're just... You're just... The year is 1974. A young Stephen King and his wife check into the Stanley Hotel in Estates Park, Colorado. When they arrived, the hotel was just getting ready to close for the season and found themselves as the only guests. An eeriness was felt in the hotel, with taped orchestral music echoing from down the hall, and the entire dining room with its chairs up on the tables. While wandering the empty hotel, King ended up in the bar, met with a bartender named Grady. He recounts having a dream that night of his three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. He got up, lit a cigarette, and sat in a chair looking out the window at the Rockies. By the time his cigarette was done, the bones of the book were firmly set in his mind. Released in 1977, following Carrie and Salem's lot, The Shining was King's third published novel and what established him as a preeminent author in the horror genre, the King of Horror. The novel is heavily influenced by King's personal life during this time, the duties of fatherhood, family life, anger management, and its struggle with alcoholism. He has even gone on record to say that Jack Torrance is quite possibly the most autobiographical character he's ever written. Well, in, in some ways, I think his father, Jack Torrance, was as autobiographical as, as I've ever come to a character because at the time that I wrote the book, uh, I was drinking a lot. Um, I didn't think of myself as an alcoholic, but drunks never do, you right. know. King airs out his grievances and confesses his sins within this novel, seemingly like his own brand of therapy. The novel begins with Jack Torrance, a struggling writer and alcoholic, accepting the position as winter caretaker of the Overlook Hotel, in hopes that the hotel's seclusion will help him make amends with his family and kickstart his writing career. He's accompanied by his wife Wendy and their son Danny, who possesses a strange and alluring psychic ability called The Shining, where he can and see the hotel's horrific past as well as sense premonitions of the horrors to come. After a snowstorm closes in on them in the hotel, things begin to unravel as the hotel's paranormal influence takes stronger effect. 
As Stephen King does, after The Shining was published, he moves on to his next project, churning out at least one novel every year for the next 10 years, only to be broken in 1988, then not again until 2007. But within the few years that followed the release of The Shining, a certain director had his eyes on the project. Hot off the critical marvel that is Barry Lyndon from 75, with an already classic list of work including Clockwork Orange from 71, and 2001 A Space Odyssey from 68, none other than the master himself, Stanley Kubrick, wanted to sink his teeth into King's work. Warner Brothers had already bought the rights to the novel, securing Kubrick the project, as well as an adapted screenplay written by King himself, to which Kubrick discarded. He denied all collaborations with King throughout the entire process of making the film, which King obviously appreciated. No. When the film came out, King was quite vocal about his negative opinion of the adaptation. After all, in his mind, Kubrick took the most personal piece of work King had written up to that point, butchered the characters, stripped away all warmth and humanity from it, and released a soulless, hollow corpse of his original novel with a slick of veneer to it. So the images are striking, but to me that's surface, it's not substance. So I used to describe The Shining, the film, as something like a beautiful car that had no engine in it. Countless interviews show King retelling the same stories about when Kubrick called up King to ask about the afterlife. He said, Stephen, Stanley Kubrick here. Don't you agree that all stories of ghosts are fundamentally optimistic? Hello, Steve. I think most ghost stories are fundamentally optimistic, don't you? He said, hi, Stanley Kubrick here. I actually think stories of the supernatural are always optimistic, don't you? <laughs> or when he visited Kubrick on set. Just out on that one meeting that I thought that he was a very compulsive, almost like anal man. The difference between the endings. And my version of the is mine ends with the hotel burning and his ends with the hotel freezing. In Kubrick's movie, The Overlook Hotel freezes and in Stephen King's book, The Overlook Hotel burns. His dislike of Jack Nicholson as Jack. I didn't have to worry about Jack Nicholson, who seemed like he was crazy from the very beginning. <laughs> Where's the arc in that? You're crazy in scene one, you're crazy at the end. <laughs> and in between, you type a little bit. <laughs> For me, there's no story in that. How Shelley Duvall as Wendy is misogynistic. Shelley Duvall as Wendy is really one of the most misogynistic characters ever put on film. She's basically just there to scream and be stupid. And that's not the woman that I wrote about. And so on. It's like Stanley Kubrick was like the coldest guy in the universe. <laughs> I have lived in one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I even got hit by a car and I still have lived in one. Even 30 years later, he still holds this belief, so props for being consistent. Interestingly enough, many critics felt similarly to King upon release. It initially opened with mixed reception with complaints of slow pace, the signature Kubrick style yet lacking any substance, and a dismantling of what was so terrifying about the Stephen King's bestseller. It was the only one of Kubrick's last 11 films to receive zero nominations from the Oscars, Golden Globes, and the BAFTAs. Instead, in the opening year the awards were created, Stanley Kubrick and Shelley Duvall were nominated for the Razzie Award for Worst Director and Worst Actress, respectively. Although Shelley Duvall's nomination was retracted in part of the controversy stemming from Bruce Willis's nomination for Worst Performance by Bruce Willis in the 2021 movie, which after being diagnosed with aphasia retracted the nomination. Duvall's nomination was retracted due to her current mental states and the abuse she underwent during the production of The Shining. So I resented Stanley at times because he pushed me and he, it hurt. And I resented him for it. I thought, why do you want to do this to me? How can you do this to me? You know, you agonize over it, and it's just a necessary turmoil to get out of it what you want out of it. I mean, we had the same end in mind. It was just that sometimes we differed in our means. 
Despite all this, the 1980s film The Shining is considered a horror classic, and for good reason. The film ranks high in various AFI lists, including villain, quotes, and thrills, as well as an overall masterpiece in not only the horror genre, but as cinema as a whole. Statements of Duvall's performance now see her as the heart of the film. She is out of her depth in dealing with her husband's looming insanity while trying to protect her young son, all while being fearful for the malevolence around her. Jack Nicholson is at the top of his game during this era of his career, as the decade prior included classic performances seen in Chinatown and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and this film just further cements that. The amount of pop culture references and parodies of this film is near nauseating, with popular animated series like South Park and The Simpsons having entire episodes parodying the film. Not to mention the number of times other shows and films have referenced the most iconic line. Here's Johnny! Here's some examples. Here's Corpsey! Here's Spency! Here's Vicky! Here's Raven! Here's Johnny! Here's Johnny! Here's Orange! Fucking kill me, dude. This is how you know it's gone too far. <laughs> the film has entered the zeitgeist of entertainment, through and through. I could literally make an entire video on The Shining's influence in pop culture itself, not to mention the countless film analysis, video essay, hidden meaning, and theory videos on the internet, but we're here for a different reason. Many years would go by until we hear anything about production of The Shining again. Kubrick would go on to release Full Metal Jacket in 1989 and begin production of his last film, Eyes Wide Shut, that would later be released in 1999. Meanwhile, King would go on to write 43 novels or novellas, not even to mention short stories. Despite this, King still held a grudge against Kubrick for what he had done to his baby. Behind the scenes, a new series was in development, with King at the lead. In order to readapt The Shining closer to how he saw fit, King had to supposedly agree in writing to cease his frequent public criticism of the Kubrick film. Finding a leading man to play Jack Torrance was an issue in production, with King threatening to wait another 18 years if the role of Jack Torrance wasn't booked. Luckily, they found someone four days before filming in 1996. Cutting it a little close, don't you think? In order to fix the blemish on King's novel the Kubrick film was, a three-part miniseries would air in 1997 from April 27th to May the 1st. May the 1st! Stephen King's The Shining. Your reservation for terror has been booked. If there was a single word I could use to describe the miniseries, it would be goofy. The acting is goofy, the scares are goofy, the production design is goofy, the logic of the characters themselves are goofy. The only thing goofy about the 1980s film is the character himself. Although, in a way, I kind of like this version as a guilty pleasure. Some of the choices are so baffling to me that it becomes entertaining. Throughout this review, I'll be going back and forth between the 1980 film and the 1997 miniseries because, oh boy, did they drop the ball on some of these sequences. And the only way to really highlight this is by showing how the changes Kubrick made to the story and structure of the novel when adapting made it the cinematic horror classic it is today, which still holds up over 40 years later. What do you want to talk about? The 80s film opens with the iconic sweeping helicopter shots over a canyon, following a lone car traveling through the landscape. A dark, foreboding score instantly immerses us, giving us not-so-subtle hints that something nefarious awaits in these mountains. Icy blue credits crawl up the screen as the score becomes more unhinged, plucking strings and echoing shrieks, until the Overlook Hotel is revealed, its massive size dwarfed by the mountain glooming above. The 97 miniseries opens the credits over black against a mystical, enchanting orchestral score that is played so repeatedly throughout the series to the point of irritation. And remember, this is his response to the 80s film. King plasters his name all over the credits, letting you know this is his vision, through and through. Stephen King's The Shining, executive producer based on the novel by, teleplay by, Stephen King. We are immediately introduced to Jack Torrance and Bill Watson as they make their way to the boiler room, with the most obvious and silly plot of Vice ever. The boiler, she creeps. This whole place is gonna go Rocky Mountain High one of these days. I understand the 80s film also had foreshadowing, but at least it wasn't so incredibly on the nose and obvious about it. 
killed his family with an axe. Okay, maybe it was a little on the nose, but like, please tell me, how do you think this boiler is going to factor into the end of the film? Not to mention that Kubrick took out this whole plot point from his. Anyways, we're told that Jack needs to come down and relieve the pressure of the boiler, by hand, every day, since the safety valve doesn't work, or the entire hotel will fucking explode. Do I remember? No safety valve, so don't forget. It, it wouldn't do to forget something like that, now would it? Watson and Jack walk over the storage room, talking about rats and city council, while Watson keeps making remarks on how much of a dick Ullman is, that warm, charismatic character that runs the Overlook from the 80s movie. Besides, every hotel's got rats. Just like every hotel's got its scandals. I'm sure the Overlook has uh, had its share, huh? I actually like the angle this version of The Shining does, where it's a poorly kept secret the hotel is riddled with scandals and controversies. They talk about it a lot throughout the series, actually. I wonder how they... Oh, of course. A fucking flashback. I understand he does this a lot within his novels, but the number of times they use flashbacks in this series is fucking nauseating. Oh, god damn it. Man, what a mess. Why cut back and forth if you're just gonna say the same information anyways? Either commit to the bit or don't do it at all, Jesus Christ. Watson goes on to tell Jack about the last caretaker, Grady, who killed himself too. Except this time. Shotgun. Both barrels. Oh, full three with this toe. Bam, bam, I'll go to lights. Yeah, I'll go to lights. Cabin fever, I guess. Remember how chilling the account of Grady killing himself was in the 80s film? Why would you play something like that in such a goofy tone like this? Let's take a look at how this sequence was executed in the 80s film. We are introduced to Jack as he enters the hotel for the first time, meeting with Stuart Ullman, the hotel overseer, in one unbroken shot, already putting us on edge. We catch some glimpses of what to come, like the gold room and the butler, and the picture frame of the hotel covered in snow. Even this early on, we can see Kubrick's expert use of framing and blocking. Each frame is mesmerizing to look at and study, similar to something outside of the hotel. Jumping ahead a little bit, we learn that Jack is formerly a school teacher, now turned writer, and that teaching was more or less a way to make ends meet. Jack comes highly recommended, with a warm and approving comment from Ullman. He goes on to inform Jack about when the hotel closes down for the season, why they closed despite the beautiful scenery, and the original intentions of when it was built. Oh, it sure would be. The problem is the enormous cost it would be to keep the road to Sidewinder open. He continues on to say that when the hotel was built in 1907, there was very little interest in winter sports, and the site was chosen for its seclusion and scenic beauty. Ullman then gives Jack the details of what the job entails running the boiler that doesn't have a defective fucking safety valve, and repairing damage as it occurs so the elements can't get a foothold. While not a very physically demanding job, Ullman warns of the tremendous sense of isolation. Well, that just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. When Ullman follows up, asking how his wife and son will take it, Jack has the utmost confidence they'll love it, blatantly lying to either himself or Ullman, just whoever believes it first. Before Ullman lets Jack go, some of the most chilling and disturbing pieces of dialogue rings through this scene. I don't suppose they uh, told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we had up here during the winter of 1970? I don't believe they did. You can feel the stiffness in this room just by this glance. Ullman goes on to tell Jack about Charles Grady, a man his predecessor hired as a winter caretaker, who came here with his wife and two daughters. He seemed like a completely normal individual. But at some point during the winter, he must have suffered some kind of a complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and uh, <laughs> killed his family with an axe. Stacked them neatly in one of the rooms of the West Wing, and uh, then he, uh, he put uh, both barrels of a shotgun in his mouth. Police... Uh, I thought that it was what the old timers used to call cabin fever. Shotgun. Both barrels. Oh. Cabin fever, I guess. I mean, seriously, what the fuck were you thinking? Anyways, Jack reassures Ullman, saying that he can rest assured that it won't happen with him. And as far as his wife is concerned, she'll be absolutely fascinated when he tells her, as she is a confirmed ghost story and horror film addict. 
I like to view this line as a sort of self-aware jab at the audience, or possibly even Stephen King himself, adding to the multiple fuck yous to King found within the film. Despite being a relatively straightforward and simple scene, Kubrick's direction really makes this scene shine. Its blunt and grounded nature forces the viewer to recognize the real potential threats of isolation, slipping into the darkest rabbit holes of the human psyche and the deterioration of sanity. Rather than the slapstick retelling of previous caretakers killing themselves, it also introduces a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, where the very idea of slaughtering his family has entered Jack's mind as a potential outcome. King claims the second Jack walks through the front doors, you already know Jack is nuts and that there's nowhere to go from there. I think the real terror comes from exactly that. Watching an already unwell man slowly begin to spin events into his own narrative, manipulating and tormenting his partner and child, and eventually finding ways to draw justification for his correction of those who interfere with his duties as the winter caretaker. Now let's pick back up where the miniseries left off. Listen, I need this job too badly to have that happen. <laughs> I know what you're telling me. Any ghosts? Fucking embarrassing. Ooh, so scary. There's a few other things that Kubrick changes from the source material, which will make themselves apparent as to why he changes them, because they're goofy as fuck in this version. For example, hedge animals are not scary. What the fuck is a bush going to do to you? They're not real animals. This is another thing I could see working really well in the book, but once you translate it to film, These hedges do absolutely nothing in the story, by the way. Every single scene with them in it is inconsequential, and if taken out of the plot, wouldn't affect anything at all. Another example is the croquet mallet. It's just not as intimidating as the iconic axe from the 80s film. Like, yeah, it'll hurt if you get smacked by one of these, but one proves to be more deadly than the other. <laughs> Interesting tidbit, this was actually filmed at the Stanley Hotel, where King got the inspiration to write The Shining. That's pretty neat, I suppose. Here, we are first introduced to the 97 version of Stuart Ullman, with awkward, stinted dialogue talking about croquet. It's more challenging than it looks, because of the size of the ball. Does your wife fully understand what you'd be taking on here, Mr. Torrance? What kind of transition is that? He sounds like a fucking robot. I don't suppose you care much for me, Mr. Torrance. Few on my staff do, I imagine. They regard me as a bit of a bastard. They're right. You literally haven't even done anything yet? You're just insisting that you're a bit of a bastard? Who talks like that? They discuss a bit of the backstory of the hotel, and how a man by the name of Derwent restored the hotel after World War II, and how well the hotel has been doing for the past couple decades for Jack to respond. If you have something you want to say, why don't you just come right out and say it? Ullman brings up Grady and the tragedy, calling it a mistake, as Grady was a drunk. This first introduces us to Jack's struggle with alcoholism. Weren't you told that the bottle and I have parted? Company. You are a beneficiary of our politically correct times, Mr. Carnes. They were doing this shit in the 90s. Can everyone shut the fuck up about PC culture and whining about people being sensitive and snowflakes now? Holy fuck, you guys are annoying. Ullman continues grilling Jack for being an alcoholic, one with less than a year from his last drink, and points out that Jack had been fired from his last teaching job for beating up a student quite badly. Quite badly. Less than five months ago. But don't worry, we'll get to see this brutal beating play out in another fucking flashback. George Hatfield. Huh? How are you think you're going? Okay, like, yeah, he really shouldn't have done that. But quite badly? The little prick slashed all his tires. Three quick ones to the nose seems a little justified if you ask me. Also, don't you think if this scene were left up to the imagination it might hit a little harder? Not knowing the severity of the incident, besides Ullman's description, would allow our minds to run wild. What if he did beat him quite badly? When you present every little piece of information and story beat, it loses some of the impact it tries to set up. I was on what the old timers like to call the dry drunk. A bad one. The miniseries leans pretty hard into the alcoholism angle, which would make sense as it's what King originally intended as he was suffering from it at the time, but they bring it up so much it becomes tiring. It also leans hard into the I love my family angle too, really trying to show you that Jack is a damaged but family man. I'll not only be taking care of the Overlook, but I'll be taking care of myself and my family. And I won't be doing any of it for you. I actually find that rather comforting. His line delivery is fucking atrocious. Oh my god. I thought that you would.
From here, we are introduced to Wendy and Danny cooking at home, and I want to punch Danny in the goddamn face. Why do you look like that? He just looks like some guy nowadays, but god, something about his face just irritates me. In this iteration, both Wendy and Jack are well aware of Danny's shining abilities from the get-go, going as far as asking him questions and addressing it outright. Did your dad get the job? Uh-huh. He and the man he talked to didn't like each other, but he got it. Yay! Danny goes to play outside while waiting for Jack to get home, being a dumb little kid as Wendy works on her artwork. And what a great time for another fucking flashback. I go off to use the phone and this is what I come back to? Answer me, you damn pup! God, I just love the line delivery in this series. It's so fucking good. Get over here, you take your medicine! He says this about 12,000 times over the course of the three episodes, by the way, so get used to it. Rather than having any subtlety of abuse, here you have it. Oh, and his drinking problem. And marital strain. Nothing ever happens again. I am packing my bags and I'm leaving. And self-hate. Wendy goes to check her husband's tea bottle, and to her amusement, it isn't just straight whiskey. She sits down and reads a bit of Jack's teleplay, while Danny is still sitting on the swing outside playing. Suddenly, he hears a voice calling to him. God, I just want to rip your fucking ears off, you damn little pup. I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, before we go any further, let's check back with the 80s film and see how they handled Wendy and Danny's introduction. Just after Jack sits down in Ullman's office for the first time, we fade to Wendy and Danny at home. They sit at the kitchen table, familiar with the ever-so-common practice of secondhand smoking while children are watching cartoons. The television and the show Danny is watching, Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner, become extremely important narrative and thematic elements within the film, which I'll discuss later. Another interesting note is that Wendy is reading The Catcher in the Rye, the infamous band novel that deals with issues like depression, alienation, processing feelings, suicide, homosexuality, and perversion, while also tackling themes of childhood, sex, and identity. Knowing Kubrick with his intense control and attention to detail, this was without a doubt intentional. The first frame of Wendy and Danny already gives so much detail into their lives within the story, and the eventual themes and issues that will persist and become prevalent throughout the rest of the film. <coughs> do you really want to go and live in that hotel for the winter? Sure I do. It'll be lots of fun. Yeah. I guess so. Danny goes on to say that there isn't really anyone to play with around here, already reinforcing the isolation he feels before getting to the hotel and before anyone even mentions it. It's established that Danny has a hard time making friends, and often talks to his imaginary friend named Tony, to which Wendy inquires about. What about Tony? He's looking forward to the hotel, I bet. Tony, it's a torch! Oh, come on, Tony, don't be silly. I don't want to call them Mrs. Torch. Well, how come you don't want to go? I just don't. Wendy assures him that they'll all have a real good time, as we fade back to Jack and Ullman in his office, as Bill Watson enters the room. Jumping forward in time a bit, after Jack is briefed about the details of the job and the tragedy in the winter of 1970, we see Danny brushing his teeth down the hall, a slow dolly in as a droning score fills our ears. We establish here that Tony, an imaginary friend that speaks to Danny from his finger, and possibly see into the future through Shining. A brief phone call confirms this narrative, as Jack got the job. This scene is just so much more effective in establishing a haunting, chilling tone. It's dripping with atmosphere and fills us with the same dread Danny is subconsciously feeling through Tony. Also, Wendy and Jack are aware of Tony, but are completely ignorant to his shining abilities. The usage of zoom lenses and mirrors play a large part within the film, as it often demonstrates characters going within their own head, showing their subconscious thoughts, feelings, or emotions. Perfectly shown in this scene, where Danny pries Tony to tell him why he doesn't want to go to the hotel. absolutely haunting interpretation of the horrors to come during their stay at the Overlook, all without a single word of dialogue. Now, how did the 97 miniseries handle this, you ask? Danny has the craziest orgasm of his life to see a 20-year-old man levitating in front of a traffic sign? Hi, Tony. That's Tony? What the fuck is going on? 
do you see what I mean by goofy now? A skull and crossbones? Really? We get magically transported to the Overlook Hotel through a traffic sign, with Tony echoing stay away as the camera pushes forward into the hotel. And what is the big equivalence to the horrific blood elevator from the 80s film? Do I really even have to say it? Just look at it. A fucking fire hose with terrible CGI teeth? God, I love the 90s. He's really starting to climax now, and we're treated to another premonition from the Overlook. Come out and take your medicine. Come out here, you damned little pup. By God, you'll take your medicine now! No! Danny cracks a smile when he realizes his father is pulling up to the house, which is a little odd. Didn't you just have a terrifying vision about how your father is going to bludgeon you with a croquet mallet? Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, there it is. Danny comes to his senses again, telling his dad that he's okay, and we are subjected to family man Jack again. But knowing what we do about him, I'm sure we'd all have the same reaction as Wendy here. Last one. Oh! Don't trap him, Jack. The loving family charade continues, with another phrase muttered 12,000 times throughout the series. Kissing, kissing. Yeah, that's what I've been missing. Wendy talks to Jack about him getting the job, and Danny's shining abilities. But what happened to Danny from the 80s after his vision? Danny comes to when being treated by a psychiatrist, his worried mother standing at the foot of his bed. Which brings us to, arguably, the most defining difference between the film adaptation and the miniseries. The controversial theory that Danny is being molested by his father, Jack. I believe this theory has some weight to it, given to us in subtle and not so subtle hints. Many of the interpretations I subscribe to for this film have been extensively documented by Rob Ager. He's brilliant at what he does, and his analysis videos are definitely worth checking out. I'm going to be pretty brief with the interpretations for this episode, so think of everything I mention as an introduction. I'll be going more in depth during episode 2. Danny lays on the bed without pants on, covering his genitals. When cutting to his close-up, a large bear pillow lays to the left of him, something that will become extremely prevalent later in the film. Throughout their conversation, Danny and the psychiatrist talk about Tony, which when listening to under a different context, tells another story entirely. Does Tony ever tell you to do things? I don't want to talk about Tony anymore. Evidence of this theory grows throughout the runtime of the film, which I'll be pointing out as they come. Another quick thing I wanted to mention here is the parallel of Wendy and this goofy figure on the right of the screen, adding to the television and cartoon motifs found within this film. I don't believe it was any accident that Wendy was dressed in this particular outfit, especially when there was a conscious decision to put Goofy here of all characters, highlighted by the black hair and prominent teeth both characters possess. Wendy even directly addresses the figure for a split second, showing just how intentional this was. This isn't the last time we'll see parallels like this either. Characters within the film end up personifying cartoon and television-like qualities, most notably Jack for a number of reasons, but also Danny, where the third act of the film becomes analogous to a Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner episode. Wendy and the psychiatrist head to the living room to discuss things further, letting Wendy know that there is nothing physically wrong with Danny, although the experience Danny had could be chalked up to some type of self-induced trance, possibly explaining his shining. The conversation continues, where Wendy explains that Danny first started talking to Tony after they took him out of nursery school, after Danny had an injury. What sort of injury did he have? Uh, he dislocated his shoulder. How did he manage to do that? This scene not only establishes Danny as a social outcast who didn't get along well in school, Wendy justifying and downplaying the actions of her husband, prior examples of abuse towards Danny, which heavily implies contributed to the very existence of Tony, introduces Jack having a drinking problem with a strained marriage and family life because of it, and Jack being clean for five months now, all in a single conversation. No weird or stilted dialogue of Ullman grilling Jack about being an alcoholic, Wendy checking half-drank tea bottles for liquor, or flashbacks physically showing the abuse of Danny. It's all left for the audience to put the pieces together, gauge the severity of the situation, and how much Wendy is either embellishing or downplaying it. What really would have been goofy is if after Jack gets a job at the Overlook, he went to a payphone in front of a bar to call his sponsor from AA. Wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, he made it very clear that he didn't approve of hiring an alcoholic as a caretaker of what he considers to be the world's greatest hotel, but I got the job and I, I just called to say thanks. Well, you know what they say at the AA meetings, don't you? I guess I should have seen that coming. 
Surely they don't throw in a completely unnecessary single flashback shot though, right? Did you tell Omen you had a slip before you left Vermont? Doc. Okay, okay, fine, Doc. could have seen that coming too. But surely he doesn't get distracted by a neon sign with a martini glass and the words ice cold beer on it. And when peering into the dimly lit bar longing for a drink, a man in a trucker hat and a blue striped shirt cheers his beer to him. God fucking damn it. Here, we're treated to some comedy scenes during their voyage to the Overlook Hotel. Come on, get off my butt, man. That's okay, Dad. Let them sit on in a rotate. Daniel Torres, where did you hear that? Hey, read between the lines, pal! We learn about the roads being closed during the winter, as well as Wendy offhandedly asking if the pantries were full, as to not end up like the Donner Party. Well, I wouldn't want to end up like the Donner Party. Who are the Donners? What kind of party do they have? Kind of a, um, a dinner party. <laughs> the Donners had a dinner. It was a Donner dinner. They had to resort to cannibalism in order to stay alive. Don't worry, Mom. I know all about cannibalism. I saw it on TV. See? It's okay. You saw it on the television. Jack and the family pull over and take a look out over the scenic view, gazing upon the Overlook Hotel in the distance. Look at how much of a loving family they are! Until Tony comes back and warns Danny it's dangerous, looking stupid as hell yet again. After nearly falling to his death, Danny and the Torrance family make the last of the trip to the Overlook, where we are greeted with this stupid score again and- HOLY FUCKING SHIT! Wait. They're just fucking bushes. This is a horror movie, right? Or show, whatever the fuck this thing is. Just throw in a bunch of Dutch angles. That'll make people uncomfortable. What are those animals, Daddy? Ah, that's called a topiary, Dan. Uh, those are animals that are made out of hedges. hedges. Yes. Fucking hedges. Jack makes this, like, weird pubic hair joke here. Yeah. Ah, I used to trim this lady's topiary. In fact, I used to trim her topiary at least once a week, sometimes twice. No way! Why? Did she have nice hedges, Daddy? Oh, they were, uh, yeah, well, uh... <laughs> Anyways, they head inside to meet Dick Halloran, the cook, and have him show the family around the hotel, but not before some more ominous shots of the topiary. Think they were coming to get you, Doc? Of course not. They're just hedges. Correct! Correct! Yes, sir. The moment Danny steps foot in the hotel, he already hears ghostly whispers calling for him. Dick Helen comes from around the corner and introduces himself to everyone, insisting on being referred to as Dick, which is as weird and awkward as it sounds. Dick, please. Bill Watson comes and introduces himself, saying some weird ass dialogue. Are you a buckaroo or a tender f I guess I'm a tender f Tenders you ever so. He also is just generally gross and disgusting. Dick, you know what, I'm just gonna call him Halloran because that's what they do in the 80s film, tells Watson to show the family around the kitchen, but not before asking Danny if he wants to lend him a hand putting his luggage away in his car. Well, Doc, you gonna give me a hand or you just gonna stand there? This is the first person he's communicated with solely through Shining, and it's ruined with this corny ass soundtrack. Halloran walks Danny out to his car, all the while explaining what The Shining is. It's essentially the same dialogue from the 80s film, just done in a much less effective way. I bet you just about going the damn dog, boy. <laughs> Halloran tells Danny to give him all he's got, and to shine away, being unintentionally hilarious. Give me a blast. Huh? Get me as hard as you can. I want to see just how much you got. Okay. And he blows his damn rear lights out. Sometimes it happens when I think really hard. Once I was at a basketball game with my dad at a school. Don't, don't you fucking and do it. I got excited. Don't fuck. You ain't a pistol, Danny. You're an all out atomic bomb. Did you as hard as you could? You didn't, did you? No. Meanwhile, Watson shows Jack and Wendy around the kitchen, giving some pretty heavy foreshadowing with a close-up of the lock on the pantry doors and continually talking about them. The way this scene is blocked is just 
not good. The characters are constantly whipping around in place as Watson tells them where everything is, and it's not supposed to be for laughs, I don't think. Then he awkwardly walks over to this piece of paper just laying on the counter. It all just feels so cheap and corny. Watson eventually tells them that since the phone lines blow over in the winter storms, the CB radio within the hotel is the only thing that connects them to the outside world in the event of an emergency. And you wouldn't want to end up like the Donners now, would you? <laughs> No, I don't. No, don't scare the lady, Pete, okay? The party goes to the dining room to look around there, as the door closes on its own. Ooh, so scary. Now we're back to Danny and Halloran, where Halloran warns Danny about those damn hedge animals. But once it had to do with those damned hedge animals. In one of the rooms. Which room? Never mind. 217, isn't it? Maybe and maybe not making him promise that he'll never go there. He goes on to tell Danny that he may see things in the hotel that scare him, but they're like pictures in a book and won't hurt him. Before the two go back inside and find the rest of the group, Halloran tells Danny that if he's in any trouble, to shine to him, and he'll make his way back to the hotel all the way from Florida. Let's go inside, see how your folks are making out. Okay. Why do they keep doing this and insisting it's scary? I don't understand. Well, that was amusingly schlocky. Let's go take a look at the 80s introduction to the hotel, shall we? After discussing the Donners, cannibalism, and television, we cut out all the fluff, arriving at the Overlook Hotel, still packed with people. Cleaning crews get the hotel ready for the winter as the full-time residents and employees leave for the season. Jack is reading a Playgirl magazine as Ullman and Watson approach him, which under further inspection, features a segment titled Incest, why parents sleep with their children. <coughs> a beautiful trucking shop follows our characters through a tour of the hotel, giving a real sense of scale to the building. Ullman mentions the Navajo and Apache motif designs decorating the interior, as well as the number of high-profile celebrities who have stayed in the hotel, including presidents, movie stars, and royalty. Danny's introduction to his new home for the winter is a bit more eerie. Playing darts in the game room, a shrill score accompanies the young boy as he collects from the corkboard. The twins from this premonition give Danny a visit, not saying a word, before smirking at each other and walking away in unison. There's a hell of a lot of interpretations of what the twins represent and their role in the overall concept of the film. Imagery of twins and pairings are littered all throughout the film, which I'll dive deeper into in the next episode. But for now, notice the two women leaving as Ullman, Wendy, and Jack head to the room, who appear to be twins, walking towards a hallway with white and blue wallpaper, the same wallpaper of the hallway the twins stood in during Danny's vision. Goodbye, Mr. Ullman. Goodbye, girls. And here are your quarters. Living room, bedroom, bathroom, and a small bedroom for your son. With a framed picture of two bears hanging above his bed frame. Perfect for a child. Yeah. Yes. After getting a tour of the room that would eventually become a living nightmare later in the film, we then go outside as the group passes the famous hedge maze, a far more interesting and inherently daunting structure compared to fucking hedge animals. It's a lot of fun. But I wouldn't want to go in there unless I had an hour to spare to find my way out. <laughs> Interesting note here, Mr. Ullman. Almost like you can foreshadow without being so fucking obnoxious about it. Just like the snowcat. Ullman tells the group construction began in 1907, finished in 1909, and was built on top of an Indian burial ground, supposedly having to repel off attacks as they were building, hinting towards theories that The Shining is also about the massacre and exploitation of Native Americans, as well as the conquest of the American West. It's God about the it. conquest of the American West, John! That's true. <laughs> the next stop is the gold room. This is our gold ballroom. We always remove all the booze from the premises when we shut down. That reduces the insurance we normally have to carry. We don't drink. Well, then you're in luck. Notice what he says here? We don't drink? Seems like he's shifting the circumstance to both him and Wendy, rather than taking on the responsibility of not drinking himself. In the miniseries... If you're a drinking man, I hope you brought along your own supplies. This place has been big clean. The employees had their end of the season party last night. I don't drink. Well... Maybe that's just as well. There's more of an acceptance here. He's actually trying and doing it for himself and his family. Changing it to we don't drink, now it's their problem, 
not Jax. It creates an interesting dynamic and way of looking at alcoholism for this iteration of the character. Anyways, now we're finally introduced to the film version of Dick Halloran, who serves essentially the exact same purpose for the miniseries, but executed in a much better fashion. Here, Halloran takes Wendy and Danny to tour the kitchen, while Ullman goes off to show Jack around the rest of the hotel. We get these long, unbroken steadicam shots of the kitchen, giving an actual perception on how large the room is. Yeah, this whole place is such an enormous maze, I feel like I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs every time I come in. <sighs> I have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs every time I come in this place. It's the same line from the miniseries, except in this movie, it actually makes sense as to why she says this line, and has multiple meanings that tie into thematic elements of the film, while also acting as foreshadowing for the events later in the film. You know, like a line with purpose? Halloran continues the tour, giving Wendy a rundown of the inventory of the freezers, while slipping in calling Danny Doc, to which Wendy questions him about. Mr. Halloran, how do you know we call him Doc? leading to some great shot composition resting just above Danny's head. Halloran moves along, showing the dry storage room, where we are first introduced to Halloran having the ability to shine. You got a dozen jugs of black molasses, we got 60 boxes of dry milk, Gonna give me a hand or you just gonna stand there? It's not even in the same league. Scenes like this really show how impactful a good score is. The Shining's very relationship between audio and visual elements is so ingrained within the film they become inseparable. Cuts and physical actions align perfectly with score cues, hardwired into the editing itself. This becomes more and more prevalent as the film continues, even during the most iconic sequences. Here's Johnny! There's a really great video by Captain Christian where he dives more into this, which pisses me off because of how good that video is. But Kubrick also understands that a score isn't always necessary either. Sometimes, it's best to let the overwhelming silence of a scene make you uncomfortable. After Ullman, Jack, and Watson return to request to Wendy's company, we can see exactly that. Do you know how I knew your name was Doc? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Danny looks like a trauma victim, not wanting to budge. He's clearly understanding, but almost seems like he's incapable of responding. Halloran goes on to say that him and his grandmother could hold entire conversations without ever opening their mouths, calling it shining. Why don't you want to talk about it? I'm not supposed to. Who said you ain't supposed to? Tony. He presses into Danny, asking him if Tony is the one who tells him things, if his parents know Tony tells him things, and if Tony has ever told Danny about the Overlook Hotel, until Danny says, Dralyn, are you scared of this place? leading us to another beautifully composed shot the second Danny questions the hotel, asking if there's something bad here. Halloran tells Danny that the hotel itself has a way of shining, and alludes that events taking place at the hotel can be seen by those who shine themselves. I think a lot of things happened right here in this particular hotel over the years, and not all of them was good. What about room 237? Room 237? You're scared of room 237, ain't you? This is just another example of how corny the miniseries was when it came to this. Here, you have this long, dramatic talk, escalating and building to Danny prying into Halloran about his fears of the hotel, leading him to asking about room 237. He tries to play it off, ignoring it, but Danny persists, until Halloran gives him a cautiously stern warning never to go into the room. Nothing. There ain't nothing in room 237. But you ain't got no business going in there anyway. So stay out. You understand? Stay out. 
but in the miniseries, it's almost like he wanted Danny to ask about it. And I saw something in one of the rooms. I want you to promise me that you'll never go in there. Which room? Never mind. 217, isn't it? Maybe and maybe not. Like, what? Could you not have been more obvious? You were basically begging him to ask you about it. From here in the film, we cut to a month later, so I think this is a good place to check back in with the miniseries. After Watson leaves, you can see a boom mic in the window, and it peeks out again just in case you missed it. When Jack and Halloran deface Ullman and turn him into the devil, ha <laughs> very funny, Danny hallucinates Ullman turning into some old dead guy. He uses Halloran's count to ten method, and boom, it turns back. Seems like this technique will be used 12,000 times in the future, after some offhand comments about the elevator, Halloran reminds Jack. Never take a chance up here, Jack. Not an overlook. Just to remind the audience that you're supposed to be watching a horror series right now, Halloran begins listing off all the presidents that have stayed in the overlook when they pass by the fire hose from Danny's vision. I don't think it's gonna bite you, do you, though? Of course not. Shut the fuck up. The group is taken to the presidential suite, where Danny hears ghosts committing crimes and this sick-ass Zolly shot. Whoa, getting a little creative, I see. Anyways, Danny counts to 10, the blood goes away, and it's over. Moving on to the second floor, they pass right by room 217, reminding Danny to not go into any of the rooms, with another shot reminding us that we're watching a horror series. The Torrances check out their housing suite, complete with an office and bunk beds. As Halloran leaves, he asks Danny to see him off. Look at how much of a loving family they are! Holy fuck, this is getting exhausting. One last shining moment, reminding Danny that they're like pictures in a book and to call if he needs him. And Halloran leaves with what I can only describe as a TV movie shot? They do it like three times and- HOLY FUCK! <laughs> Sorry, just those damn hedge animals again. Keep him safe, Lord. That little boy, most of all. Please. Just fucking leave already. Here's another TV movie ass shot for you, by the way. Like, oh, look, what little budget we got could afford us a crane, so we gotta use that shit. The rest of this episode either isn't in the film or moved around to very different parts of the plot, and for good reason, because it's fucking stupid in this iteration. So now it's October 20th, and this next subplot makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Jack is re-shingling the roof for some reason? There's one throwaway line mentioning that Ullman wants Jack to re-shingle it. Ullman want me to remind you about the roof. Oh yeah, he wants me to re-shingle it. But at no point was it established that he knew how to do this, and you can tell because he's doing a pretty piss poor job too. Then he gets stung by some wasps and nearly fucking dies. <laughs> he has this really weird masochistic relationship with these wasps that I'll come back up later too. In hopes of getting rid of the wasp nest, he heads down to the work shed to grab some wasp killer, where we now establish the location of the snowcat. And of course, it wouldn't be the 97 miniseries without his iconic catchphrase. You'll take your medicine now, my nasty little friend. Wendy and Danny return, and he kept the wasp nest? What was the point of that? Danny! Danny, don't! Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Killed them all. Slaughtered them with a bug bomb. Are you sure? Just fucking throw it out. So what do you say, Doc? It's yours if you want it. Of course I want it. Can I keep it in my room, Mom? Go on, Doc. Be my guest. Okay, it's official. Um, these are not real human beings. Afterwards, we're treated to some more happy family shtick, where Jack bluntly asks her, Are you happy? This is the happiest I've been since, since Danny was born. This continues on for a few minutes. A little Tom Brady kiss on the lips for good measure, until Danny goes into the bathroom to brush his teeth. And we are now greeted again by Tony. Danny, we have to talk. Go lock the door first. Do not lock the door. Why would you lock the door? Almost immediately, Wendy goes to check on him and notices the door is locked, because why wouldn't she, and yells at him to open the door, irritating Jack now. He instantly busts the door down to boom, Danny freaking out on the toilet. He starts mumbling random shit about parties and axes until he finally comes to, yelling about Tony, until Jack just smacks his head against the porcelain. You know, will you stop with that crap? What the hell do you think you're doing? 
I think one of the reasons the 80s film is so effective is that it doesn't actually show Jack being violent until the third act of the movie. But here, Jack is constantly threatening to beat the shit out of Danny, and actually does. So when it comes time for the big third act, it's like, yeah, he was just doing what he was doing before, but just more now, I guess. But in the film, by the time he fully snaps and gets physically violent, he's wielding an axe and hacking through doors. And people! We get some more... ominous shots of the hedge animals again, which adds nothing to the story. Now we're back in Danny's room, presumably sometime after the toilet incident. Jack and Wendy ask about Tony, and why he asked him to lock the door, which leads nowhere. Jack tries to leave the room like four times, but Danny keeps pulling him back in. It never hurt mommy or me, would you daddy? The slam happens later on in one of the most disturbing scenes in the film, completely rewriting its tone and implication. They talk about Jack's alcoholism and how he's different now, some foreshadowing with cocaine mallets. Tony said the mallets are dangerous, that I should stay away from them. Not so subtle foreshadowing, I mean, until Danny falls asleep and Jack walks away. Just kidding. <laughs> Oh uh, no, he finally leaves Danny's room, reminding us of the fucking wasp nest chilling in his room. Some paranormal activity starts going on in the hotel. Lamps turn on, clocks chime, fireplaces erupt in flame, the record player plays a tune. This dog head appears that turns out to be a crucial plot point in the future for some reason. Back in the bedroom, Wendy tells Jack that if it happens again, they need to take Danny to a doctor. Which does happen in the film, but again, in one of the most disturbing scenes, completely rewriting its tone and implication. Because of the implication. They talk about Jack's anger issues, his problem with his father and her with her mother, but they make up and make out, whispering sweet nothings to each other until the wasps come back. Who would have guessed? Danny gets bitten up pretty badly, to no surprise, as he had the nest right next to his fucking head. Even if he did, why would you keep it inside? It's so fucking dumb. This completely avoidable scenario never would have happened if one, he just threw the fucking thing away, even if they were dead, and two, if you both didn't agree to let him keep it in his room. Jack goes to grab a container from the kitchen, with another shot reminding us that we're in a horror series. Why don't you sting me now? Jack begins taking pictures of all the stings his family got, telling Wendy he'll sue for five grand a sting? And that the wasp killer was defective or something? Why didn't you just throw it away? Why do I have to screw up everything? Oh, Jack, you don't. Well, he kind of did, didn't he? Jack goes to get rid of the nest, after he and Wendy decide to take Danny to a doctor the next morning. Just after leaving the wasps to freeze, every chair in the dining room falls off the tables. The swings begin to move on their own. A croquet ball passes through wire, and an ominous crane shot pushes past the hedge animals, leaving us with the Overlook Hotel as the first episode ends and fades to credits. <laughs> Subtext. Everyone knows yeah. what The Shining is really about. Shut it's up. about the moon landing, Mike. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> Did you see Danny's sweater? Did you know? It's God about damn the it. conquest of the American West, John! It's true, it's true. <laughs> Hasn't anybody seen that documentary that's full of shit?